Hi, welcome to the Physics 122 pre-lecture video on Gauss's Law. So we know that charge creates the electric field. We can state the general uh, electrostatics problem in this way, that uh, given some specific charge configuration, we need to find the electric field everywhere in space in the vicinity of that charge. So we have a tool for doing that. So far, we've looked at Coulomb's Law, which in uh, differential form can be written like this. It's 1 over r squared law. And then, of course, we can integrate this. But it's an integral we do over all space. Um, we call the method of applying Gauss's Law direct integration. However, it's often technically burdensome or technically complicated. So for example, here on the internet, I found uh, a, a demonstration of the application of direct integration of Coulomb's Law to find the electric field due to a line of charge. And as you can see, just setting up the problem requires a fair amount of cumbersome trigonometry and calculus. I'm running this about 10 times speed, and even then we only get to the point where we actually set up the integral without actually solving it. So it's, no, it's complicated. Generally speaking, we want to avoid doing direct integration if we can. So today we're going to introduce an alternate scheme called Gauss's Law, which can be written uh, in this form, uh, e dot dA over some closed surface is equal to the enclosed charge over epsilon naught. And if we add this plus symmetry, uh, we can often find an easy solution to calculate the electric field. In general, much easier than direct integration. So let's look at Gauss's Law. What does it say? So the thing on the left side, E dot dA, this is what we call the electric flux, often written with capital Phi, just like this. So when you see that left side integral, you should think the electric flux. Don't think of the integral over e, e dA, just think the electric flux. And it's a flux through a closed surface, so-called Gaussian surface. The Gaussian surface has to be closed, and we define the area vector pointing perpendicular from the surface outward. So good examples of Gaussian surfaces would be, for example, an imaginary cube, one that you thought of. Imaginary in the sense that it doesn't actually correspond to something physical. And then you could put some charges in the cube, and the area vector would point away. Of course, a real physical box is also acceptable. It doesn't have to be imaginary. Or uh, the surface of a sphere is also a good Gaussian surface. Or uh, the surface of a potato, again, defining dA outward. As long as the surface is closed, it's a good Gaussian surface, whether real or imagined. So for example, the surface of a bowl, which is an open surface, this is not a good Gaussian surface. We can't use this. So here we show an example of applying. We have some kind of potato-like imaginary sur surface, which is closed. So we have a charge Q0, which is inside the surface, and another charge negative Q0, which is outside the surface. So for fun, I can draw some field lines. Here we are, some field lines, with field lines going from the positive to the negative. And I can calculate the flux of field lines through that surface from inside to outside. I, generally speaking, would have to take a service integral, the dot product between the electric field and the area element. But I know from Gauss's law that this is just equal to the enclosed charge over epsilon naught. Gauss's law is always true. It's always true for any imaginary closed surface. It doesn't matter where you put the charge or how it's configured. One way to think of the flux is it's something that's proportional to the number of field lines that penetrate the surface. The net field lines, the outgoing field lines minus the incoming. Basically, every time I put a charge inside, I get more field lines coming outside, so I get more flux. Gauss's law says that the flux depends only on the charges that are inside, not the charges that are outside. Here I've got two charges inside. And so the flux is just equal to the total charge inside, which is negative 2 q naught divided by epsilon naught. It doesn't depend at all on the charge outside, plus a q naught. 
So I can have any configuration of charge. Here I've got a spherical surface and I'm putting all kinds of positive charge in a crazy pattern outside. But if there's no charge inside, the flux is zero. That's what Gauss's law says. It's not that the field inside is zero, but the flux is. So Gauss's law is always true. It's always true that the flux is equal to the enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught. You don't have to calculate the flux. You just calculate the enclosed charge. And the flux, of course, is defined as the integral of the surface on the surface of e dot dA. So you can always find the flux, but you can't always find the field. Flux and the field are not always the same. And in particular, you can't just write down the flux and expect to know the field. To, to find the electric field, we need Gauss's law, plus we need something else. That something else is symmetry. Symmetry makes the calculation of the surface integral easy. It makes it possible to pull out E and A. So for example, if the electric field is constant and A can be calculated on a simple surface, then often E dot dA is just equal to the constant electric field times that area. So we're looking for symmetries where that surface integral is easy to calculate. And it turns out there's only three symmetries, spherical, cylindrical, corresponding to like a tube, and planar, corresponding to say a box or a sheet or a slab. And that's it. That's all we need to know for now about Gauss's law. And so the takeaway message is this. Gauss's law is always true. If you want to know the flux, just calculate the number of enclosed charge and divide it by epsilon naught. But if you want to know the field, even though Gauss's law is always true, you need one more piece of information, and that is the information provided by symmetry. So we'll see this week how to actually calculate the electric field under different symmetries.